Hello, 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 and welcome back to the second part of today of our convening of our symposium on transcultural and transdisciplinary collaborations within the arts. I'm very happy that we can dive deeper from where we left up this morning. If you missed it, it was uh, filmed and you can look it up where we asked about mythologies, where we asked about um, practices and how these practices either entrench collaboration or not. And we would like to take a step out now and ask a wider question, which is maybe the most relevant uh, question regarding these collaborations, the question of societal transformation. Um, we have a very diverse panel today, and I'm very happy about that. Um, I'll also explain a little bit how the panel came together, but I'll explain this while we go along. Um, I would like to start with my favorite um, job description ever, probably, um, Dr. Pia Hollenbach, who's sitting here. She's a disaster risk expert and senior researcher at the University of Technology, Business and Design in Constance. And if I read this, a disaster and risk expert, it sounds like you're an expert on the last 40 years of my life, but that's not <laughs> what you're doing, right? I don't know your life, but <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not uh, an expert on your life. But I'm a geographer by training. That's the discipline I was trained in. And uh, then... I happened to come to Sri Lanka when the tsunami happened in 2004, and obviously that made me an <laughs> expert in disaster management and research on disaster rehabilitation, how people interact with their environment in post-crisis situations. So that's um, me in a nutshell. But I mean, I'm really interested in this moment. So you went to Sri Lanka, and we had a little uh, chat before we sat down here, and you said to me, you didn't go there for that. I mean, you didn't go there prepared to be thrown into a disaster so, so. so actually, I was hired by the University of uh, Heidelberg. They have a South Asia Institute, and they run different local offices in Pakistan, India, and Sri Lanka. and. I was hired to be the head of the office in Colombo. And I signed the contract in November and in December 2004, the uh, tsunami happened and I was about to actually leave. So um, I negotiated with the German embassy and the uh, air company that they take me on a plane on the 1st of January 2005 to enter into Colombo, and then the embassy th needed personnel to manage the German part of disaster rehabilitation activities. <coughs> and so, um, yeah, I worked a little bit at the embassy to coordinate uh, German aid, and then part-time became a consultant for non-governmental organizations in Sri Lanka how to coordinate all that massive income <laughs> interventions that entered into Sri Lanka. So, I mean, just to give you a number, 600 new non-governmental and governmental and aid organizations entered post-tsunami into Sri Lanka. So you can imagine at one point we had a tipping point, we had no recipients of aid, but many people who wanted to give money <laughs> to recipients. And that situation also triggered for me the interest to do research after three years being in the field of post-tsunami aid interventions as, an, um, as a consultant with an aid organization to really understand what does that do to a country in a post-crisis situation if there's so much aid and good intentions coming does it create something good to the people who remain in, their, in the situation, in the post-crisis situation or post-disaster situation? And I continued to ask the question, still don't have an answer. Well, I have some <laughs> ideas what does it make. 
um, because then in 2015, the same happened. I did a research project in Nepal, left Nepal a day later, the earthquake happened. So I flew back to in the storm <coughs> of the event to understand what does the disaster make to the place and what does all the interventions who come do to people in the moment of trying to understand the crisis, the disaster, the impact, and in the moments uh, to traveling on a rehabilitation journey. So. I mean, you mean immediately understand why I'm asking these questions, right? It's, it's, uh, I mean, one is the origin story of superhero, that's always interesting, of course, but it's, it's also kind of setting the tone of what we're discussing today. So by doing that and inviting you I kind of maintain that we are in a disaster zone in a way, and it's about um, you know changing something about transformation. But your experience was that if it's done in the wrong way, if we just throw if there's a lot of NGOs and things happening at the same time, that it might be also counterproductive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we need to find out in your job, but maybe also in a wider field and the ones we work, um, how to smartly go about it. And this panel is also um, the launch of a publication um, by Sonja Schenkel and Björn Müller, um, who did a research into creativity for a regenerative tomorrow, also how can creative actions, creativity in itself, creative endeavor, change something in the tomorrow, make it more regenerative, I guess, from the title. But it will tell us now maybe a little bit more in detail what this is about. So, but this is a research in exactly that I mentioned, how to intervene and how to use creativity as a tool. Or what, what, what is this research about? What is it about? Thank you, Damian. Um, you ask, how can art serve change, right? And maybe that word change we can already start replacing by asking, how can art serve transformation? And the difference here is really about form. Because what I experience, and actually part of why PIA is here, because we have been working on several art science projects for a number of years, and we know each other, and the exercise has really been about constantly reframing and dealing with the emergent and not knowing where this is taking us. So transformation is really about that notion. And together with my colleague Björn Müller, who's sitting right here, maybe you'd like to stand up for a moment. <laughs> um, we looked at transformation as a work of mainstreaming. So there are different models trying to describe what is transformation and how is it happening? And one of these models that we chose, and that is also described in this publication or in this uh, draft paper, um, and I come back to why I say draft paper, um, is the model of the multi-levels. Meaning um, we have a mainstream, we have what is valid, generally seen as valid, and that's also interesting with regards to innovation, right? Usually innovation is seen as type of creativity that is labeled as useful. So not necessarily neither radical nor transformative, but within the mainstream, right? So there's the mainstream and then we have the niches. And these niches are kind of pushing and pulling within that system so that can actually bring new narratives to that center of the mainstream. And then there's another level uh, level, and that's like the grand debates that are kind of pointing to transformation, but they're not really pushing for it, not in the same way as the niches do. These grand debates are uh, the sustainable development goals, uh, debates around climate change, so things that we are aware of and are kind of part of the mainstream, but they're not specific. So uh, in our research, we, we spent a year uh, working together with Mercator Foundation, and we looked at uh, 50 organizations within the arts and culture, basically trying to understand 
who is doing what, what is happening, obviously, in this very uh, reduced frame, and how could we create a typology or a kind of um, a logic, a system that helps us locate what is currently happening and what may still happen or what is missing in a better way. And we came up with four main tasks that art and culture address currently. And here I come back to the notion of the working paper because last, last night, uh, yesterday, um, we already presented part of the content of this paper and with the invitation really to dialogue with us. So this is the nature of the, the working paper. It's a conversation starter. And the levers we ha have identified for like actually changing these systems, they're, I would say, incomplete, or they are to be revised, they are to be discussed, they are to be specified. So these levers, which are attached to four tasks that we have identified with regards to arts and culture and societal transformation, uh, these four tasks are um, collaboration, midwifery of the new, ending, and the fourth one, please help me, Bjorn. Diagnosis. Diagnosis, saying what's already happening, right? Um, so with these four tasks, you can actually deduct and locate different types of intervention. Now, yesterday, somebody came up to me and said, this is too nice, midwifery of the new. We need a revolution. We need gut feelings being present. So we took note of that and already started, you know, kind of um, enriching the debate. But this is just as a brief overview. Thank you. So we will, you know, delve into this more in detail, I think. But maybe then the first question you said that uh, this research was mandated by the Mercator Foundation. And lucky for us, we have the director of the Mercator Foundation here, um, Andrew Holland. Why did you initiate such, such a research in this way? And why do you publish now, um, together with, with your colleagues, um, a work in progress, a working paper, um, an invitation for dialogue, instead of saying, these are the definitive kind of parameters? I know it's a, but let's delve into it. I mean, those are questions I could speak on for hours. Yeah. Because it's a lot to do with your in German, it's a haltung, your values and your attitudes toward things and how you really want to proceed. The first question is why do we go into the subject? It's a very personal answer. I mean, I worked as an artist, as an organizer, as an activist. I worked as a cultural politician. I worked in law and, and so on. And when I went to Provets at the time, I realized we have to change things. And I noticed at the time, if I want to change supporting the dance in Switzerland, I don't just do something top down, I have to do something really attacking the systemic level and I have to have all the different stakeholders around the table. So then we co-initiated a process called Project Dance where we had about 120 people working on from early education to end of career with everything in between. So there I learned if you get people around the table, as you define yourself not as top down macho boss, but as a servant to a system and you work with the actors and you believe that if you create space and room for people to work, speak and be intelligent, usually you get good results. So I brought that knowledge into Stifter Mercator. I left uh, Proets in 2017, where a topic was very important for me at the time was social impact of the arts. But I noticed that in the Swiss Arts Council with legislation, regulations, the time was not quite right to go into that. So I left that with a big longing. So knowing what can we do to change things. And it came together at a moment when I realized that um, art can be very essential in all different topics, all different challenges we have today, because it has elements, competences, skills we don't have without art. We often start talking, then we come into vocabulary issues, and it's bingo bullshit, sorry for the wording. I do get impatient when I speak about the situation of the world. Then the ego comes in, and so on, and so on. So for us, it was very important to start thinking, how can we launch a process, and that's coming to your second question, which is not us knowing the world, because we don't, and I don't believe anybody knows the solutions. So all we can do is just try, test, learn, and go forward. And most of the time, we just get blocked, because people, popularistic, popularistic, they just know the answer, but they don't. So what we're trying to do here is to chain a process 
of people, of organizations from all different sectors, artistic practitioners, organizers, science, politicians, economy, funders, and so on, to really start thinking, what can art contribute to save the planet? And just a personal notion from my background, I heard this morning when I zoomed in, it was often, can art serve? And for me, serve is always like, oh, yes, can the art serve to the big system? Coming out of a very period of where the art had to fight for recognition. So we use the wording contribute. And I believe very much that art can not just contribute, but can also be a motor. And the reason why this paper is just a paper is because we very much believe we have to solve this together. We have to get into a process, into a laboratory, and start thinking, and start working, and start acting. That's why it's a paper. Did I get it right? We had big okay. discussions about the wordings <laughs> at first, but I, th I think we're quite in line now, because we're both quite happy with it. And so, also from our side, it's an invitation, because what I believe severely in is we have to create movements, gangs of people who go forward, because time is changing all the time, and we just stagnate. So we need dynamics. So this is the first step, maybe, to the next gang or Bandenbildung in German for transformative art. I mean, that's something that Ravi and I have uh, been doing, uh, just the two of us. It's a very small gang. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for the moment, for the gang moment. Gang of two. <laughs> we, call, we call ourselves. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, but w what, what Andrew is saying, I mean, ties exactly into what you're doing. Yesterday we talked about this, um, and this morning we, we didn't again, about this world sensing as one of the heuristics implied by art, right? So he says, there's nobody who can tell us how, this is how it is, but artists have these possibilities in, in their multifaceted, multi-perspective approaches to, to have some world sensing done, which then can be brought together. And you're in this unique position, Ravi, that you are on one hand an artist with a practice, but you also um, are the, can, I, can we, I mean, we published it, we can now say, right, that you are the co-convener of yes. the... Ingrid. <laughs> Ingrid, is that fine? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's the co-convener of the next Bergen Assembly, which as a format works very much along the line that Andrew just um, sketched out for us. So how do you... It's very early, the, the Bergen Assembly is in 2025, you still have time, right? But how do you, would you describe your starting point now, to, from this artistic perspective of world sensing? You, this question you keep asking is to see, they see, the see, we see, right? Towards how do we create these spaces where these discussions, these clashes, these, these um, new beginnings can actually happen? So uh, I'd like to take this question a little from my own perspective Please. because, uh, as you say, I'm an artist, but that doesn't mean I know much what art can do. <laughs> and why I say that is because at what point you start being called an artist is when you produce something. You produce some work and somebody says, okay, this is artistic work. That's the time you become an artist. That, but I think the artistic way is something which makes you as a person. It precedes the production of work. And I think that's the reason I want to separate the idea of art from everything else you do in your life, as a functional being, to what constitutes you. And I think an artist is constituted in a certain way, in the way one wants to do something in life. It's like a, what makes you say something. Uh, your sense of values, as you said, or where you see the world. And probably many of us are artists who don't produce any work. But at the point you produce the work, people see you as an artist. And then you start being categorized as an artist and start functioning as an artist. But I want to separate this idea of fun the functional artist from the artist itself. And maybe it's, it's a difficult thing to think, but uh, as, an, as somebody who's called an artist, I would like to propose that. Uh, I also run an environmental activist organization for 30 years. So I can talk for hours about social transformation and also say that, what does it mean? What does social transformation mean? Uh, who are we transforming? And what are, the, what are the structures we need to change to transform something? I mean, I worked on UN policy for a long time, and has it transformed anything? I don't know. The UN system is in rubbles right now. Or is it, does it mean we change the whole capitalist finance system? 
we decolonize everything. What does social transformation mean? It's an open question. What are we transforming towards? What is the progress of this idea of equity, uh, liberty, freedoms, which we talk about, this perfect human condition through which the social society must progress? It's un we, are, we are on this volcano of structural problems, the way we are constructed. So I keep coming back to this idea of how do we think of the world? What, what, how do we create the world? How do we create this world we are in today? And if you think of the questions I think about a lot, you know, in terms of the ecological condition, we call it the crisis. I think the condition started 500 years back. The crisis just appeared now. Uh, it's a crisis in the making. It couldn't have gone anywhere else but this. As all trajectories of, uh, of extrapolations of data will show from the great acceleration to now, that we cannot go anywhere but here. This is like, like a dead end road, and we keep fighting it. So what do we need to do to not fighting it? I think we need to reimagine re the world. Now the artist in me wants to reimagine the world. Maybe the, 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 these activists in me see the limits of the reimagination, but I'm not interested in the limit as an artist. I want to say that I'm interested in seeing the world in its transformational change and what that implies. And for me, that informs who I am and what I do. So the reason why I feel always uncomfortable as art, as a functionality, uh, and I've been put in this situation many times in my life because I run an NGO and also an, called an artist. So they must be somehow connected, in a sense. They're connected at a value level because you know, I gave out a corporate career to become something else. So that means I didn't value this idea of spending my whole money selling you know, soap or something, as corporate people do. So it is a sense of, but the values come from somewhere else. So I think the connection is only at that level, what informs me as who I became. Everything else I do, many other people can do as an activist or something. And sometimes if you work as an artist and an activist, it's, it's detrimental because you know, if you work, suppose you're working in the social sphere, then my colleagues in the social sphere cannot understand why I'm talking about art because they want to see a, a direct political change and I should apply myself to that. There's been a whole history of political movements and the relationship to the art in, 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 in many parts of the world. It's a, it's a difficult kind of negotiation if you go into the social movement as an artist. They want you as, as somebody who's contributing to the social. So that's why I keep the artist part of me as something which I belong to, and uh, the art part of me, and you can call me the artist, and I suppose I accept that willingly because it opens up many worlds for me. Uh, <laughs> it does, it's, it's, a great, it's a great privilege to be called an artist, I think, because it helps you think about and, and manifest things you would not have the space to manifest otherwise. Why would a museum want to show anything I want to do? I mean, who am I? Unless you're an artist, right? Mm -hmm. So it opens up great cultural spaces. So, but in that sense, I think uh, today we are in a state where social transformation itself needs to question, what do we need, need to transform for social transformation? Mm -hmm. And I think I want to think about, all of us think about it in the deepest level. Yeah. It, it embodies a whole, way of being we have, we have embodied today, who have we have become as a human society. I mean, this is actually the title of your project. I mean, when I first read that, I didn't know you. I really admired your guts, you know, like to call a project, a project space, we are awareness in art, is, was at the time before we knew you, um, quite a statement. And, 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 you know, it's like it's taking something that Ravi is saying that he tries to also kind of keep it separate, that sometimes maybe activism and, and uh, art are not really nice with each other and, and you sometimes need to decide. But you as a curator and, and have taken in the name a certain activist stance in a way, right? Yes. And, and I mean... Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah, great. So, yeah, I started like two and a half years ago and I was thinking for myself, you know, how do I want to live? And how do I, I so I realized I want to do something where I can see a certain sense and where I can create a space for collaboration and dialogue to see where we want to go. And in the beginning, when I founded it, 
yeah, I was pretty much alone. And then I, when I was working on the first exhibition that was called The Future of Many Futures, I contacted the artists and then I realized while dialoguing that I'm not alone, that there are lots of artists and people that have the same mindset and that would like to be part of, uh, of change and have a lot of ideas and visions. And, and my interest was in sciences, so yesterday we heard as well science means knowing and knowledge and for me knowledge uh, wasn't only from natural science but anything can be knowledge while sitting, sitting us together creating knowledge and so I wanted to create, a, the idea was to create a dialogue and a space for dialogue between uh, human, like social justice, uh, ecology, uh, different kind of sciences as well, challenges of digitalization and because this is a, we are all aware that we are using technology every day and to track the visibility of it as well and so connect it to the arts because for me the arts has the power to transform and to and I think while collaborating on an eye level between experts, artists and scientists and the community we are really able through dialogue to yeah, to change and to develop together. And that's actually how the project came together. And I would now more say um, awareness maybe through art than in art, because what is art, right? And um, so we developed as well for the different exhibitions we did. We developed educational programs, and we still do. So our pillars are on this transdisciplinary or however post transdisciplinary, however we're going to call it, um, uh, exhibitions and making and the education around it, together with artists and uh, experts. And because I realized that we, you spoke, Sonia, yesterday about caretaking or end life caretaking. So I think this it's quite new uh, what we were doing and as well uh, the word experimenting resumes it very well. So kind of creating new formats of space where we exchange and I think mediation is a very important part in this because as well what I, when we started and people came into our space to see the exhibitions so our idea was to come to introduce what we do so that people can feel safe and they know where they are and they get an introduction into the space where they are and the topic. And th what was very enriching when people often said, oh, but this is so interesting, I can connect to it, to the topic, you know, and to the way. And I think art, the art has as well this power of generating this connection on an emotional level. And I think that's what actually makes us continue with what we do. <laughs> yeah, that's something else. Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah. No, and um, yeah, so and I please I welcome as well to come to see our exhibition that is on right now. It's called Energy Giveaway at the Homos Punk Library. So it's uh, the Regenerative Energies Communities Collective, a collective between uh, experimental designers, artists and scientists that uh, founded this movement in Sweden and it's all about how can we generate regenerative energy out of soil. So it's a kind of an invitation of uh, generating an energy imaginary of the future. And I think these kind of collaborations yeah, are showing the possibilities, one, one way of, one possibility of where these collaborations could go. And I think the exhibition that we just opened together with uh, Johnny Jetzer uh, in Basel called Experimental Ecology, it was uh, artist and science in dialogue. That was an experiment, thank you, <laughs> yeah, for, for us as well. Uh, you're gonna find as well a, a copy, thank you Ravi, at the, at the entrance if you would like to know more about it. it was about this dialogue and artists having, and scientists collaborating. And I think a very important point what came out from the artists and the scientists we are not so different you know <laughs> we have made different methods of but then you know and this collaboration asks for compromise to compromise maybe as well and collaborate and I think it's great you know to have this discourse and that's why as well I like that it's a dialogue the paper that you produced for this. <laughs> <laughs>
But I mean, we call this also the whole, it's about practices and collaboration and it's so nice, you know, to have a dialogue and speak with each other. I mean, I like also the punk aspect of the Hummus Punk Library, right? And I mean, you yesterday, Bjorn, said that what we are doing here is not a negotiation. It's not a peaceful process. The other side, whoever they are, you can define that for yourself, they're not peaceful. They'll kick the shit out of us if we are too, too successful, right? So, I mean, I, I kind of like dialogue, and, and we talk about collaboration and all that kind of things, but the punk aspect of it seems to be important. And you also said, like, you know, Andrew, kind of tearing down these top-down structures of funding and how these collaborations should happen, but asking you who kind of has... Um, probably a data-driven um, uh, approach also to these questions. Does it help if we tear down old structures, or do we need even stronger structures to implement transformation? Okay, I... Um, Is there research in this area? I'm sure there's research in it. I'm not doing this, and I'm not a fan of structures, because I think <laughs> they... <laughs> They limit us in a way. So I know also, you know, I'm a mother and people tell me your child needs structures, otherwise it gets crazy, la la la. Yes, I totally understand. And I, we live in structures and I experienced how structures limit myself in, for example, doing research with an artist, being thinking out of the box, thinking innovative, what we would this uh, define as innovative, but then we don't fit into funding structures. So, and my life is depending on funding. I'm not a professor because I did never want to be in the structure of university politics. So I'm always only hired on project money, which the project I create with other people together. So <laughs> I actually don't like structures because they limit me very much. So I have to find the right passwords, I have to find sexy notions, what is actually my research about. And my doctor father always said, fake it until you make it, write it as they want, and if you have the money, do what you wish to do, okay? You need to find that confidence, but um, I think it limits really also the creativity as a researcher. And I, I, I'm not an artist, <laughs> but I feel I am an artist because I think research is an art. And I'm a qualitative uh, researcher, so I interact with people living in a space which is new to me. I lived in Africa, I lived in Sri Lanka for three years, so I really embodied myself within a culture that is not my first home, <laughs> but now it's my heart and soul home. Um, so I experienced many structures that limit myself, but also that actually enabled me to learn. And I think what you said, you know, playing with different heads, you have like positionalities. And also this morning in the discussion, we had uh, performances. And I mean, a performance is also a way of positioning yourself in structures because they force you to perform. So, okay, anyway, I'm, I'm, f <laughs> I'm walking away. But I think structures, in a way, should leave us the space to really innovate, to be able to think not in structures, which is really twisted, I think, and I like that Mercato is opening up <laughs> into a way that we can flourish together with people that come not from our home discipline, but in souls we are together. For example, working with Sonia, I always said she helped me to find a language as a researcher that triggers emotion in an audience that I usually not talk to, right? So it opened me up, it challenged me to think as a researcher how to communicate results that we generate as researchers and how I can trigger emotion that really help to convey the message as a researcher that help people to step into changing processes. And that's the beauty of working with people that 
are out of my comf comfort zone or my home where I come from. And I think I just had a long conversation <laughs> during lunchtime. What, we also, what I feel it is if you arrived in your self, you have the confidence to not think in structures and boundaries and try to float in what is given to you. The way that, that Muhammad Ali floated, right? <laughs> um, still stinging like a bee sometimes. <laughs> no, but what you're saying is like build gangs or bond and building, but importantly also as much as possible transculturally. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about Africa and Sri Lanka, right? Mm -hmm. But also like post-disciplinary, mm -hmm. what we've been discussing all, all the time. When you did this research, Sonia, together with Bjorn, um, I mean, you looked at so many projects. It's a lot <laughs> you looked at. And there's only a couple of selected here. Um, was that, I mean, you, you read it. It's, it's quickly read. It's very to the point. But was there beside, you defined these clusters and these kind of shared ideas and all this kind of thing. What was the most, what didn't you expect to come out in such clarity? Was there something that you kind of see clearer now after talking to so many projects who declare themselves to be looking for sustainability and such things? Yes, I think uh, there are two things that came as a surprise to me. Um, one was that um, the cases where we really went deep like where, where we had long interviews and we were talking with them and we took what we heard with us and we were riding our bikes and eating and sleeping and uh, making sure we breathed and everything. We were living with this knowledge for a few months, right, and digesting it. Uh, what came out was really that um, these organizations or many of them who, who have managed to reach quite... Um, Relative, uh, important results, they have a very clear plan, but at the same time, they keep on learning. They work with the emergent, but at the same time, they have goals. So it's like this union of, of opposites, of apparent opposites that they actually pursue. And each time I hear the word revolution, that just feels like, uh, you know, the, the, the opposite of what we're currently doing, and that's not going to solve. It's, it's like maintaining the system. And I think that was another relevant question that we looked at. So in which way are, is art and culture, are art and culture actually maintaining a system because we don't question our own narratives? So there, we, we are very familiar with the, the position of questioning others and, and disturbing and rupture and, and, and diagnosis and, and putting the finger on the wound, etc. But are we actually questioning ourselves? Like, what are our own biases? And there was one particular project where they started a new initiative. And for the first four years, they didn't produce any art, no results, no exhibition. They were just going around asking people, so how do we create change, that they use the word change, right? Uh, it's one example, but what I really like about this is that they didn't know the answers from the onset, and then they started an inquiry that keeps, that's still going on. And I think that's, that's quite an interesting path. And um, so, um, this, uh, because you were asking what surprised me, what, what was, um, like what struck us as special within this research was really this this union of, of, of forces, like of apparent opposite forces going from uh, providing clarity regarding a goal to uh, dealing with the emergent. And I think this is also what we're trying to do now is we by setting up this typology, right? Saying, okay, we have this structure, but at the same time we want to learn together. So it's not necessarily a contradiction. You, you mentioned this clarity, right? And it was also something coming up in the discussions in the last two days, that art can facilitate help sometimes um, by putting a spotlight onto something, looking at it from a different angle to clarify things, to, 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 to make it visible, to give a voice to. These are all beautiful things. And I always think about but the art, and this is very personal now from my point of view, the art I like is very ambiguous. It's very, 
ambiguous. It's very, the things I like in art are ambiguous, they are not clear cut, they are multifaceted. Sometimes they, a lot of art I really like, I hate. You know, I mean, it's kind of, what the, I hope I never meet the artist, right? But I'm really taken by the art. So, <laughs> ambiguity and contradiction and all these kind of things seem to me, and interesting enough, if we talk about art, we would all agree. As soon as we talk of art for societal transformation, this nearly never comes up. So, Andrew, should we, like when we now start this process, when you start now this process, invite people, you know, you said, hey, they said, you're too nice, we need a revolution, right? Do we need to find other vocabularies or should we introduce vocabularies we use for other aspects of art more also for the transformational aspects like ambiguity, like darkness, like um, forces of, of revolution, whatever it is that is not um, clarifying, understanding, exposing. How do you see that? To, to be honest, I don't quite understand the question because for me it's obvious we knew that we need to use that kind of vocabulary. So I'm quite I'm like thinking, why is he asking this question? Of course we have to speak about the dramatic situation, about ambiguity, about not knowing the unknown and so on. So and that's part of the game. I and mean, that's the real life, that's true. But aren't you and missing so, that in a lot of discussions about this aspect? Do you, when you discuss transformation? I, I put the book down because we're going to very critical issues. Like if I'm in the philanthropic sector, yeah. I'm, I'm not that, well, I'm board member of the Roof, the Roof and Bread organization, so they probably do like me. But I'm one of the few, when we sit around, like, thought, thought of lead thinking foundations, oh, we have to be optimistic, we cannot take, and I'm more than anyone who says, we have to say the truth. We have to be really, we say, now, this is a problem, but there's hope. But the whole attitude I observe in many discussions, it's the same the left wing, the right wing, the center parties, it's always like this kind of, oh yes, it's a little bit, a little bit. And I come, I mean, we spoke about it before, my background is a punk scene anyhow in the 80s, so I believe very much in just pushing, saying, and doing. And I like what you said before, I never thought about that, that artists, they do put in question, they criticize, they think about others, but we have to start thinking about ourselves. And what I notice a lot, and that's just a big word, and it sounds probably really esoterical, and I don't mean it that way. What I experience when we try and do transformation, we often stop because individual egos, egos of systems, organizations. And I believe very much we have to start also going into individual transformation. And this paper here, maybe it can be misunderstanding, but I'm on the kind of, not a mission, but I'm trying to convince other funders, because as mentioned before, there's a lot of artists and people working in the arts field who want to work in this direction, but the funding system is just completely not there to support this kind of work. Funders don't so Yeah, well, Richard's, yeah, but I'm more from the arts thing, but I'll add on. I mean, nobody supports processes, ideas. It's always like, have a project, do an offer, present it, next application. How on earth can you be transformative? How can you work on things creatively and change things if basically your time running behind money, fulfilling, you call it fake it to you make it. I mean, I wrote on the other side a lot of applications. Basically, you write something just to get the money, but you don't really do what you want to do. So there is a huge need, not of everything to change in the funding business, because some things are great. They're great overs and they're great presentations, but the funding systems, public and private systems, don't start opening up to a complete different paradigm, how we can really support transformative arts. I mean, it's so hard for artists to do this if they don't have the money, because we need the money, like me for my children, for the family, for food, and so on. So there's a big, big problem. And our role, at least that's what I put myself in, not speaking of myself as an artist anymore. <laughs> Uh, is to bring in the systems that we really can get it done because the funders need the artists to do it. But who does the first step? And at the moment, I think funders are blocking processes. Mm. And the reason for this book, that, sorry, now I got taken away. Uh, the reason why this paper is trying to simplify things is not because, as you said before, we believe this is the solution, but if I speak to other funders, 
about transformative art, they say, oh yes, we just renovated the windows. Oh yeah, we lose, use less paper, somebody told me last week. But there, there's no understanding what transformation can be in, in the funding business. So this might help us put it simple enough that people who come into it first can have an approach because it's so complex. And what I learned in life is we're still working with linear, simple solutions, but complex problems need complex solutions. And then we finish with the ambiguity. Hmm. And well, I mean, there's a reason we call this the Kronos Initiative and not the Kronos Foundation, right? It's a, exactly that idea of being in a process for the next couple of years, right? Um, and this, by the way, is the first thing we do. So this is the starting point for exactly that. Um, so I'm sorry, Martina wanted to say something as well to Andrew? Yes, I, mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, I'm dealing with this issue now for two and a half years. And what I realized helped us, I mean, we are not over the struggle, that to find really one person that, believe, that comes to see what you are doing and then is able to really transmit the this knowledge and the enthusiasm to the board. <laughs> because often it's something that is not really easy to, it's Im like working on the emergence, as you said, right? So they don't really know what it is. And as for a lot, it's still art is kind of doing li a lightning system of a conference room. But uh, to have maybe one person that kind of has this enthusiasm in the, in the foundation that is able then to, yeah, to speak to the board, board members that eventually are not there yet in this process. And I think that's why this is so important, that there is a, an analysis that speaks as well to their rational minds, <laughs> maybe on one side. Hmm. I'm feeling too much... Depression. No, not depression. <laughs> no, no, too much, too much everybody agreeing again. That's why I'm opening the panel. Um, yes, he's very good to disagree. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Bjorn. Um, I just want to pick up on the on your let's say um, vote for also ambiguity in terms of, of of art and what it brings. And I think it is a very important, but maybe in a different sense. At least, um, let's see if if we disagree or not. Um, I think transformation is a normative endeavor. And there's two ways to go about it. One is to say, like, I mean, one of the biggest questions in our society is what does it today mean to move forwards? And it's very unclear what this means. And one way is to go about it and say, like, and come with this is the way forward. I don't think that's a very fruitful way to do it. Um, but what art especially can do in its ambiguity is also to provoke, to open up public spaces where people can actually confront themselves with the question itself. You know, where are, where could we be going? And maybe inspire, maybe give ideas, but the ambiguity is about opening up, let's say, facilitating even the normative kind of questions that need to arise and that are so, so rarely discussed. So this is where I sense the, the ambiguity of art is especially important in not giving answers, but provoking us to ask different questions and to come into also maybe a clashing discussion around that. I was of course hoping that um, somebody would ask transformation towards what, right? Yeah. And you kind of gave one answer already from your research, from your point of view. But you wanted to say something to Bjorn? And to you. And, and to, to me? me. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So I just want to think about this word ambiguity, which seems to be brought in as a counter to a teleological or a certainty. Yeah. And I just want to think about how do we come to this point? We think that everything is not ambiguous. You know, that how, do we, how do we imagine that anything in life is not ambiguous? Is it the insurance companies which are telling us that? Or is it sign, our belief what science is telling us that? Something has led us to believe that life is, is not ambiguous, that, that mortality is the only thing unambiguous we have in life, right? That everything else is ambiguous. And about this idea of, uh, uh, you know, I don't think to any artist the artwork is ambiguous. I think maybe to somebody who collects or looks at art, it might open a world of ambiguity and maybe touch yourself back to your own ambiguity. Uh, 
because you want to reach out to the artist to touch yourself back to your own life. But the artist's work is never ambiguous. Art is very clear in a certain uncertain way for, to you, but the artist's process, you look at any great artist and the, the, the processes are very, very much not ambiguous about what they're doing. So there's a signature to that. But the idea of ambiguity is a very interesting idea because it's been brought onto us. It's not something which we realize the moment we are born. And look at the way we think of science as not ambiguous. I'm really sorry. <laughs> if you look at the process of science, what does science, even what physics tells you, what does quantum physics tells you about certainty? We all know that no measurement is certain. What did Niels Bohr tell us about, about that how do we measure something tells you what, to, what you find? So this idea of certainty is being brought upon by some kind of political idea of having some kind of fixed future. But if you embrace ambiguity and vulnerability, we are back into the human condition. That's one thing I wanted to say. The second thing I want to say to you is that you look at a, a, a community which feels it has been deprived. There's no uncertainty about what they want. There's no uncertainty about the world. We can sit here and say there's uncertainty about the future, but look at a Dalit community in India, which just wants the, something change. Just very quickly, the, the Dalit community is the lowest caste. There, there's, there's nothing unambiguous or uncertain about what they want. They want a better life, they want better income. They can tell you in five words exactly what they want. So un, the, to inhabit in uncertainty about future, is also a bourgeois position, yeah. I think. So that's what I'm saying, that when you talk of social transformation, let's think of what that word means to whom, and which society, and what does, maybe we should say social shifts, because no transformation ain't happening. Yeah. As we can say from the climate change debate, we're not doing 1.5 anymore, right? We're doing 2.6. So there is no transformation <laughs> happening. Hmm. I see many hands, and this is great, but I just take one minute to disagree or to add, sure. <laughs> depending how you want to see it. So it's the babushka, right? You said there's ambiguity, but then there's none, and then, so it's again ambiguous. Um, I also sometimes get very practical, say, hey, look, we have one planet, there are boundaries, we have a problem of resources, it's quite clear what to do, right? We need to get, like, get into action. And I get slightly impatient when people start telling me, yes, but you know, Nana, about ambiguity. When, I, when you initially started talking, I became slightly nervous. I was like, okay, this is becoming really intellectual that I find unpractical for my limited horizon, right? But then when you added the, the dimension of the Dalit community who's, who has a very clear vision of what they need, then, then we, have, we are in this interesting zone where the clear goals meet the process of constant reflection that I mentioned before. So. It's a good discussion when the host gets insulted so elegantly, uh, <laughs> constantly. I think Marie was first. Do you still want to say something? You're, yeah. good. You're also um, a friend. I can here we go. And then to Michael, yeah. But this is a very good conversation. I'm really enjoying it. And I kept thinking, you know, what would this whole conversation look like if the panel was called not art for societal transformation, but structural transformation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I ask this precisely because, you know, we. We often talk in terms of, you know, and I do think changes at the personal level has to be made. And I say it as a yeah. teacher today, because my students are constantly talking about, how can I change? They don't say, how can I change the system? They say, how can I change myself? And we have reached this point of neoliberal self, you know, self-care, self-changing mode, where we are not looking so much at structure. And I, it is very interesting, every year, like I've been teaching now for 11, 12 years, the, 12 years ago, or maybe it was right, I was teaching in the United States right after the 2008 financial crisis, there was a demand for societal change, yeah, structural change. But with every passing year, my students talk about the personal changes they are making. And I'm like, these are, these are still 18-year-old kids. Like, how did, within a decade, this shift happen? So I, I keep thinking that. And I think there is, a, I, I still wonder what this conversation would look like if we began there. May, may I just add on? Please, yeah. Uh, that's something we've been through. When I came to Macarta, it was all on individual behavior. Yeah. But data today show individual behavior won't save the planet. We really have to go into structure, into structure. And so we started shifting our whole way of, of advancing the processes towards structures, infrastructures, and so on. So completely agree. The reason I said before, individual transformation, 
the reason why, why people, politicians, neoliberal and so on, don't change is their ego, their incentives, their bonus systems won't allow them to accept that structure is more important. And so there I meant we need transformation to be open to different ways to go forward than up mm. to now. Just by the way, we do this again. Hi, my name is Dipjani Patajaria. She's the, she's the chair of the history of the Anthropocene at the University of Zurich, so has a lot of experience in this field. If you don't have fancy titles, you just say, hi, I'm Michael. <laughs> you are Damien. <laughs> it is very good. Soon though, right? No, but you wanted to ask a question. It's actually a remark and it's actually yeah. a question. So um, we're talking very on, on a high level. So we're talking about transformation. We're talking about change. I th I'm a bit astonished also, it also applies to the arts that is always considered as it, if we apply arts, if we apply change, if we apply, apply transformation, that it, then it goes into the right direction. And I think we have to somehow name where we're going or what the actual aims are and that this is considered work, and that's where it comes to be very small, actually. What are we actually doing? And this is where the personal is involved that you were mentioning, Andrew. Uh, this is work. This is also what defines us. This is also what gives us dignity, and this is also where it becomes very political. Yeah. So my question is more like, or if it is formulated as a question, is uh, what are we, where do we go, or what are we actually doing, and not how are we going to do it? I mean, it was interesting. You started to talk about values. I haven't done that since Sunday school. <laughs> it was like you mentioned values, you mentioned values. It's, it's, and your question goes in this direction, right? I mean, what kind of values inform the direction that we want to go into? And so far, we still haven't said. I mean, you said no. It's important that there's no clear connection, uh, no clear direction, maybe, Bjorn. And now you're saying, no, it's, uh, it's the opposite. We need to have a direction. We need to have an idea of where we're going because just because we apply art for societal change doesn't mean we're happy about it in 20 years, right? I mean, D'Annunzio was a great writer. Mishima wrote beautiful books, just to say. She was first. OK, quickly, uh, two, three things. Uh, uh, <laughs> I love trinities. I love trinities. Um, I, I Say hi, I'm so, sorry. Hi, I'm Janvi. Uh, and I'm not an alcoholic. Um, as of today. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, my, my sense of humor is bad. Ambiguity <laughs> is not a bad word, right? Like, and, and that's what Ravi is trying to communicate, is that ambiguity is not the antithesis of clarity. Ambiguity is something else, and I think we need to create um, uh, how do you call it, a, 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 so, a social critical appreciation for the richness of ambiguity. And so I think, uh, and I think that's what I got from, from Ravi. Uh, structural transformation, I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, so I agree with you completely. I, what I only have is the hard memories of, of the last agencies that use the word structural transformation, <laughs> which was structural adjustment, structural transformation, which was the World Bank and the IMF in the 80s, uh, in, the, in the late 70s, 70s and 80s, where they decided literally where money that was loaned to the developing world had to go and where it could not go, as a result of which primary education decimated um, uh, certain kinds of uh, microfinancial cooperation. Co exactly. Co Exactly. And so that's why, what do we mean? Who, what, what are these structures? Uh, where does the agenda for structures come from? And I think that, that so that's kind of very, very important. And finally, to, to know the point that, you, the point that you just ended on, which is about the direction of travel, right? I think, quite frankly, fundamentally, I don't know that we are that uh, we are that disagreed, right? Like, I mean, I, 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 so when I think of it, so what, what, what is the, what is the cluster of things that we think are good society or not good society or good politics or not good politics, right? Fundamentally, the planet should not disintegrate. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, violence is, you know, we, we, all societies agree violence is bad. Not all societies agree. 
Well, I'm just paraf. I'm just. Well, correct. you know, fair point. Fair point. The but extreme, I think the extreme left does not agree on that. Yeah, I know. No, no, but they are not societies, right? Like they are, okay. they are sort of, they are, they are bands. This they is, are, this is goons. a tangent. Yeah. This is a tangent, absolutely. No, so I think there, there are, there are some right. very, there are some very simple things. Are not simple. No, not simple. I take that back. But there are some points on which we can find a, a, a clustering, right? And. If we identify those clusters and begin to work from there, of course, it, it's never easy and it's all kind of complex. But fundamentals, I think, are there, right? Like if we begin to kind of just sort that bucket, you know, and, and put those things in. But I anyway, that's, that's Bjorn, I just quickly give it to Mari because she has been holding her hand up. Oh, sorry. It's just because yeah. I really yeah. feel misunderstood. No, please, I then feel correct misunderstood me. by what you said. Correct me. No, I didn't mean to say like, it's all about putting ambiguous uh, things on, on for, for, for an experience. Like when I teach at university, I teach on topics of societal transformation. I have a, I have always this double role of being of having a position on it, of bring in a, a, a discussion on values, but facilitating a space where where students have to make sense themselves of it. And I feel that's very important to play always this double role of not shying away from also, you know, having a position, having a clear position on, we feel this is important, but still not giving this as the final answer, but opening up a space then for, for, for discussion, for sensing, for, um, yeah, also for clashing maybe. Mm -hmm. So, Marie, and then I'm afraid we are at the same point in our discussions that we have so much to say and discuss, and, um, but this plans for later. So, Marie's question will be the last question from you a uh, lot. Huh? Who's? Monica had also a question. Also, so, Monica is then the last after Marie. Then you can, you know, maybe add something from the panel and then somebody else has to organize the next symposium. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Marie Klasse, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think I'm again disagreeing. Just, you know, because I think if you put that on a very, very basic level, I mean, I, in a way, of course, I do agree with all of you, and I think that's in a way the problem. You know, we are sitting in a room where it's so obvious that we are kind of, we all want to go to the same direction. We all want the same, no, Ravi doesn't agree, that's great. But I think, you know... I don't agree. <laughs> that's great, you know, but I feel that... I can't speak for everybody, so I don't... It's very know. obvious in a way that it feels a bit like, yeah, we are all very much on the right side. And I don't think that, you know, neither art nor transformation is a word, or are words that are moral, you know? You can say which transformation word too, but also art is not a moral thing. It's not, we can't say, oh, let's use art. I totally agree with Damian, you know, you can't say, oh, let's use art, and this is going to lead us to a better world, or it's going to be great, or, or we are going to gain amazing things. You know, I had that conversation the other night with Adam, and we were saying, okay, what do you actually do? You publish a book, let's say by Simone Weil, an author you admire, and you believe that she is somebody you should read for social, uh, societal transformation. And then after a while, you realize that actually people from the far right are buying these books, loads of them. They are using it for transformation, but for sure for transformation that maybe uh, Simone Weil didn't want, we for sure we don't want it. But you know, I think we do need to speak about the fact that we can't just say art is a vehicle <coughs> for transformation. It's, yeah, I, I feel that we are missing something there. Um, and may I answer? To this, and I think you know we had once have been on, a, on another discussion um, organized by a human rights institution, and it was about the discussion of uh, SDGs, like sustainable development goals, and the role of art. And <laughs> I mean, I think first, I mean, as you said, we all agree, and I think we all have great ideas of what to do and how to collaborate. 
And I think we need as well the structure that we are able to get the funding to collaborate on one hand. And on the other hand, it's all about bringing, I think what you say, what can art do? I think it's about different perspectives and opening up, bringing different perspectives into a board. For example, I was once speaking with a politician and he said like, yeah, the artists are, they can decorate rooms, right? But no, I mean, artists should be in a board. I think it's important to have different perspectives. If I speak of artists that can be of all arts, of all cultures, or like people, like speaking, being more inclusion, having different local communities in it, in general, I think it's about having a different mindset and having different perspectives into 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 change and as well structures where, bring, where this could bring change. Into, bring it into one space, right? These different perspectives. Monica, last question or comment from the floor? Oh, that's a pressure. There's no uh, pressure. Yeah, because, you know, with every comment and question I've heard, it sort of has shifted, so I'm not yeah. really sure I'm prepared for this. But uh, one thing is um, the, the societal transformation is, I think, is we are still very much, um, we're bringing it down to individuals. And as um, Andrew said, we know from, um, from scientific research that this is not the way to go. So the structural transformation, the, the direction is very clear. It's the planetary boundaries and the democratic decisions we've taken in our case in Switzerland. So there is no... Um, debate about uh, 2050 Switzerland net zero. So um, it's, um, and, and I think it's no, um, there is no choice in whether you want to um, embark on this mission and to play a role with it because it's a democratic decision we've taken and it's only the question, um, what's your contribution to that? Well, but that's easy to say, as we still have a democracy, whereas some of our friends here soon might live in a different political system. Democracy is not a unifying, unified term right. yeah. across so, the world. But I would ask you to maybe kind of react a little bit to, to now this, and I'm happy for that, these contrarian mo uh, votes now as well, um, if you want to. Please. Um, I, I think there are some points mentioned which really touch me because I believe very fundamentally in what has been said, if I understand correctly. The, the working paper is not called Art for Transformation. It's called Creativity. The working paper is not called Art for Transformation. It's called Creativity for Transformation. And there's a reason behind it. Art is like a sector. It's a job. Uh, creativity is something artists have that everybody can have. And our model, when we do co-creative processes, we try to get together various competences, mindsets, skills, because we believe if you have creative skills, if you have economical knowledge, uh, political knowledge, and so on together, you can create a space or room, that's not that easy, where there's an atmosphere that people speak from person to person, not from title to title, but they speak on eye height. Then things can start getting going. And it's not the artist title or the economic or the title, it's about competences. And that can be an artist, it can be a skill. But what we don't do enough, we don't get out of our bubbles. We don't speak with other people who at first might have a complete different opinion. Because it's like, oh, the enemy, the other side. What I've experienced, if you can find a relationship basis on, on the human level, you can start speaking about the real problem, which often we share, because as I said before, basically we all agree. We cannot say it because we have a political agenda. We cannot say it because our bonus in the bank is linked in a different way, or maybe from, we're from a left-wing party. But if we can get people together and they speak from person to person, if they bring in their skills and we have multiple schools, multiple sectors, I think we have a slightly bigger chance that we can go forward. Please, Ravi. So I just want to bring this idea of societal. Mm -hmm. Again, I said this in the, yesterday and yes. earlier, but I'd like to reiterate it that we are one species, but we are not one society. And we are also not only the human society. If you look at the planet, there is a more than human and non-human society. So these things have never come into the idea of social, social transformation. Somehow they never factor in, because we've created a world without nature, in a sense. So to bring, it's a, going to be a huge challenge. 
And I think we need to reimagine the world. If, uh, if you want to call art for transformation, it, it's a so social transformation, not only it's in human societies, political, and, uh, it's imagining different worlds in which people live. These are not the same worlds. A fisherman in, in South America, in, in, uh, in Bay of Bengal, is not the same world as an Amazon Indian in thing, and it's not the same world in Zurich. They're different people. They occupy the world differently. The way they think of the world is a different way. There's a different person there. They're the same species. To understand that is not an easy job. And to, the only thing we can do is to, under, to accept that they're different worlds. And what has happened in this whole project, global project we've had, is to unify the world and, and cause huge erasures, because if we don't belong here outside, now we have this language of inclusion. So is inclusion transformation? Because inclusion doesn't change anything except you include somebody in, in what you have. But doesn't, so we have to go to a, through a radical shift of a reimagining ourselves as people. If you call a really de democratic system, do you understand what real democracy is? That means different voices are, are equally in the parliament of the room. And that could be non-human voices as well. So that is the planetary future I'm talking about. And we can only, if we can't imagine it, we can't get there. But are we ready to even imagine that? Because it's going to cut across everything. There's no right or left wing in this, OK? This is much beyond the right and left of human politics, I believe. Sure. So that's what I'm saying, that the we have to really uh, as an artist, that's what I think I can do. Because if I talk to anybody in a discipline, they will tell you from the disciplinary practice. And it's not enough for me. I want to propose to you a completely different world and imagine it. Now, whether we can get there or not, without the imagination, we can't even start Im thinking how to get there. Second last statement, Pierre. Yeah. I <laughs> it, it's so difficult because I, I, am, I think I'm in between everything, you know. I, I call myself because I have to, a researcher, I'm an expert on something, disaster management and that and that. But actually, you know, Ravi, in situations where people experience a huge rupture of their everyday life, right? I mean, I experienced tsunami, post-earthquake, post-war in Sri Lanka. I lived in Sri Lanka also during a war time. S listening to people and their aspirations, you know, they are also, I mean, this is sometimes what I feel. These voices are often not represented in discussions like here. I mean, this is very elitarian, right? I mean, if I go to fishing community where I have a long-lasting relationship in Batikaloa, they went through a war, they went through tsunami, so many difficulties, and I would sit with them talking about this, they would just call me crazy, right? Because the everyday is a complete different, their aspiration is different, their world and their understanding, what I can do, I can listen, and we can find, and that's actually the beauty as a researcher that I get paid to trying to find the commonalities of humans, what we have together. And only on this, I think, a healthy future can grow. And um, I mean, I'm a daughter of a politician. So I was raised very conservative in Germany. But uh, for me, you know, also having this in my luggage, knowing how my father, father raised me in his kind of political understandings, helped me also to to maybe imagine a world beyond what I have experienced as a child. And that made me what I am here today, because also I learned to listen, to find a commonality. And I totally agree, we are all humans. We all run, blood runs through our veins. As my father always said, don't get shy if there's a high politician, he just goes to the toilet as well. You know, you, know, you can always bring it down to commonality. But what I want to say, a discussion like this today for me is also very elite driven because I know reality is in the world that would completely disagree what we are saying. And yeah, the, exactly, you're saying it in your words, I'm saying it in, no, no, with I the agree. head as a research, no, no, I, but <laughs> then, and then the reimagination for me is, you know, I just want everyone to live in peace and peace also for the planet 
And um, yeah, maybe that's uh, my last word. Yes, um, adding to that, and it seems like the term ambiguity might be quite central to conclude this debate. Uh, kind of been looking for a better word, maybe we'll find one together in the coming months as the Kronos Initiative continues and maybe Mercator will continue um, their work as well on this. Um, we had a, a workshop, a brilliant workshop actually, on Thursday together with Eva Maria Spreitzer and some of you about futuring, how to make futures as in plural. And we asked a group, uh, several groups of people to imagine what um, objects could emerge in the year 2043. And one group created a quite terrifying sculpture called the Unifier. <laughs> and when I initially heard about this Unifier, I was like, this is wonderful. So we'll, 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 once we have the Unifier, we all agree, because what the Unifier does, he violently makes sure that everybody's the same, right? And once I had expressed this point of view, the, one of the creators, I think, was Roland. He looked at me saying, but that would be a terrible world if we all agree. If it, everything is the same, it would be horrendous, right? And that's when it dawned on me, like, okay, we're looking for union, but we don't want a unifier, right? So don't worry, we took him down. <laughs> but we did take some photographs, we shared them. Um, but on the other hand, because Ravi was, uh, and, and I think Pia and Ravi were indeed saying similar things in different words, um, there are some commonalities that we share, and uh, we have emphasized in our publication very much the role of finding ways of collaborating, and, and it's, it's actually quite specified in the different levers, how do you find this collaboration, besides having this very, you know, kind of your own expression of how you see uh, the world and what you want to trigger in it. Um, so uh, we had a project with um, Pia, and I'll, I'll conclude very soon. It was about a brilliant failure in international partnerships. And we, it was about how do development in development projects, how does the so-called North collaborate with the so-called South and what happens, right, on a relationship level. And we uh, ran into COVID in the midst of the project, so we had to transfer most of it to Zoom. And we were a team made out of a professor from Sri Lanka, a professor from Rwanda, uh, Bolivia, La Paz, uh, Pia, and myself, so in Austria and, and Switzerland. <laughs> and the first time we met on the Zoom, we said, okay, talking about brilliant failure, we also have to ask ourselves, what is the, our biggest fear, like our biggest fear of failing? And we ask everybody to change, rename their, themselves in the same, like in the way, like replacing our own names by declaring what is our biggest fear mm -hmm. regarding failing, right? <laughs> did, okay, one, two, three. And we did it so that we would, so now ready, tack, and we put it. And I had the same biggest fear as the professor in Sri Lanka. And I remember looking at him through this blurry Zoom because I had bad internet, and I think he too, him too. And there was just a moment of, of, of kinship, like saying, oh, he was delivering, not delivering on time, just as a side <laughs> remark. Anyhow, Damian, I give you the last word. Uh, well, no, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're running terribly behind, as always. So there will be a coffee break now, and you have to come back here on time to go together to the opera. That's the only way you get something to drink. <laughs> I'm just saying. Huh? <laughs>